feature renderer in Kinetica is great for showing individual features. Um, and by that, I mean, if you're looking at a ton of data at a very high zoom level, it's probably not a good idea to use the, the feature renderer. At least I, I found that um, the heat map is more um, uh, useful for that scenario. But if you're zoomed really far and you're looking at individual points, uh, that the feature render is great for. Uh, shapes as well, lines, polygons, multi-polygons, um, any kind of complex shapes. If you want to actually draw that shape, you're going to want to use the feature renderer. So heat maps, again, heat maps were uh, useful for looking at a ton of data at, at high, higher zoom levels. Um, you know, you instantly can ascertain the density of the data, where most of that data is. Um, there's a ton of color schemes. You can play around with customizing the way this looks and reveal. Um, uh, heat maps will not render shapes. So heat maps will only generate a heat map. If you're trying to somehow generate a heat map out of a polygon, um, that's not gonna work. You're gonna wanna use the, the feature renderer. Um, there is a maximum resolution limit in the configuration file in Kinetica. So if you're working with displays at a very high resolution and you're finding that heat maps aren't rendering, um, I would advise you to check that and maybe increase that for your specific needs. Um, the last thing I want to mention is, uh, you know, heat maps are based on where the data is. So it's the frequency of the data at a particular location that makes it more intense, but you can use any other attribute in the table. Um, and try to generate a heat map off that attribute. Um, my only warning there would be it, it, the result may not be what you expect. So try to play around with that and, and make sure the heat map that's generated uh, makes sense. Uh, we looked at tracks. Tracks were the, the flight data. Remember, tracks are points associated with the time value that represent objects moving across the map. Uh, in order to build the track, you need a location represented by XY, you need a timestamp, and you need some unique identifier to tie that data to that particular um, set of uh, locations, right? The, the particular device or the particular uh, airplane or the particular truck. So that represents, um, that would be represented by your track ID. And the, the tracks... And use case probably seems like it has a lot of very relevant real world applications, right? From logistics to supply chain. Definitely. Um, yes. Yeah. As I mentioned, anything that's moving and, and that we're collecting data for, um, it makes sense to store that as a track. And uh, you can imagine that our, our work at the postal service, um, our work with other logistics, uh, you know, the trucks uh, moving along the highways, carrying uh, deliveries, carrying supplies, uh, tracking efficiency that way. Um, there's a lot of analysis we do with tracks. Uh, class break rendering was uh, where we were able to differentiate uh, based on an attribute. Um, that attribute has to be either a string or a numeric attribute because you have to be able to create individual um, intervals, uh, individual classes to style. So if there are strings, you can, you know, say you want to style um, maybe the payment type. So Visa, MasterCard, Amex, uh, you can color code the, each of those payment types differently and represent the point uh, differently. Um, or if it's a numeric value like we played with, with the passenger count, you have to make intervals like uh, we did where the passenger count was between zero to two, two to four, four to six, and then style each one of those differently. Um, the style does have to be defined for every single class that you create. Um, so your WMS request can become a little long because there's a lot of um, repetition. Every attribute has to be defined per class. And again, the, uh, the documentation is um, on the Connecticut site, uh, all the parameters, everything you can do with each of the, the rendering types, all the um, color options there, all, all, all the um, required uh, optional and everything you're going to need to know is on that site. And you don't need to remember this URL. Um, I typically just Google Kinetica WMS and it's the first link that comes up. 
Um, labels are something I didn't show in the demo, but obviously if you imagine rendering a lot of shapes, it would make sense to have labels on top of them, especially if uh, those labels are in the same data set. Um, so in our example, you know, we had the, the states layer uh, in, in our table, we had the state names. Um, it would have been nice to see those state names over it. Um, and you can do that by adding a label layer. So uh, the, it would, the important thing to remember about labels is that it is a separate layer. You cannot render labels and geospatial data in the same layer. Um, but the way you make the labels appear on top of those is just by overlaying the label layer on top of your shape layer. Um, and fonts have to be loaded on all the servers in the Connecticut cluster. So the, the fonts that you're going to use in your labels must exist.